The history of the M1 service rifle is typically remembered as having been mainly written on the battlefields of World War II. When we think of its role during the conflict, we picture riflemen carrying the M1 through snow in Northern Europe or across beaches of islands in the Pacific. Mass production during World War II is what made all of that possible, but that part of the M1's success story was years in the making, and getting there is a story in and of itself. To learn a little more about the rifle's early history, I've come here to Springfield Armory National Historic Site, where the M1 was born. And it just so happens that I'm here on the weekend of the 2019 GCA convention, so there's kind of a lot going on here at the moment. But first things first, right now, I have an appointment in the museum with Springfield Armory curator Alex McKenzie, and he's pulled some examples of the M1 that narrate the story of design development and early production. So follow me, this should be interesting. Now Alex, in the past I described this M1 artifact as the Mona Lisa of M1s because of the significance of it being serial number one. What do you find interesting about this one? You know, it certainly has that aspect of, of being really important as the first M1 ever made, but you take it within the context uh, of, of its manufacture. They're not quite there yet. We're in 1934. Uh, this is still a work in progress. They were working on not only making uh, the design itself better, but one of their big priorities was using the manufacture of this and the other model shop uh, Durands to, uh, to figure out how to make these. So we might have the greatest battle implement ever devised, but we haven't figured out how to mass produce it yet, have we? Right. And there's a long drawn out story that comes before this. There sure is. Uh, you know, if you think about it, and you know, John Garand hired here in uh, 1919. This is 1934, so there's 15 years of design and development and testing and competition, all sorts of stuff going on that leads up to this moment. And this isn't how it would have looked, uh, you know, when it was made in 1934. Um, again, this was, a, uh, this was a test piece. They were working out uh, details, as I said. Uh, uh, so there are different parts swapped out, uh, notably on the exterior, you know, that a little later front sight is not a model shop front sight. Um, but also, uh, one of the things I find fascinating that you can't see is uh, uh, the inside of the stock is completely charred because they were doing endurance testing and trying to figure out how well these designs uh, in this uh, configuration worked. Even though there's so much that comes before this rifle and so much that comes after this rifle, it's, it's still kind of fascinating and electric to be standing in the presence of serial number one. May I hold it? Sure. Thank you. So now we're looking at serial number 81. Why is this an important M1? Well, 81 is actually the first one uh, manufactured off the factory floor. So whereas the first 80 model shop Garands are made in, uh, in the model shop, and uh, 81 is the first one to go through the system they designed um, to go through factory production. So it's really uh, important in that it's the first one to go through um, what they hoped would ultimately be a mass production uh, capability uh, of this rifle. This is reminding me to remember something important, that is that the genius of the man that designed this was not just the design innovation that went into making this a reality, but also the fact that he was able to design processes by which this could be mass produced. Exactly. So he could Henry Ford the M1 rifle in addition to designing it. Right. And, uh, and it also is a great illustration of, you know, um, what it takes to manufacture these in terms of going from raw materials to being issued to uh, soldiers on the front. Uh, they didn't just make them and send them out the door. There were all sorts of tests um, and evaluations that they did uh, in the middle of manufacturing and even at the end. So one of the distinctions of number 81 here is that it did not pass function firing and took a little while for it to get uh, uh, past the, the tests that would have happened when this was completely assembled as a rifle. It makes the story of the M1 rifle more human in a way yeah. because it wasn't just perfection from the start. It had, its, it had its troubled time period and 81 represents that nicely. Mass production, fails function fire, 
but then eventually it, it gets dragged through and it passes. Yep. Um, but still, it doesn't do it immediately. It makes the M1 rifle look more, like as a character, it looks more believable and fallible and human. And I kind of like that about it. In the pantheon of M1 rifles, number 87 holds a special place, doesn't it? it sure does. It's not a nice round number. It doesn't have a one or a zero or anything like that. But it is a first. What makes 87 uh, cool is that it's the, uh, it's the first M1 to pass all function firing and all testing. It's the first to get its proof stamps and the first to be ready to go out the door. In this way, 87's just as special as serial number one. And we're well on the way now, so we can mass produce yeah. this, the greatest battle implement ever devised, um, but there's still a long way to go because it's got all this up here. It's still a gas trap M1 rifle. Sure is. But at least now you're starting to, uh, this is the very beginnings of getting uh, issuable rifles out in the hands where of course you're, in a way, that's its next round of tests and a way to see how it does in large numbers in the field. Uh, the uh, folks here at the Armory, starting with uh, Mr. Garand himself, was certainly uh, very excited. When this, uh, when this rifle came off the line and passed all tests. And so we have to get to number 87 before we can get to the next Im important milestone, which is transition from gas trap to gas port. We're still a long way away from replacing the gas trap system, but at least we're at the point now where we have a semi-automatic service rifle that can be mass produced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in about uh, July 1937 here. So, this is actually the function firing target from serial number 87. So this is a victory lap. It absolutely is. We finally have the world's greatest rifle and we can finally mass produce it. Although not quite as well as they, they ended up doing in the future. They knew there was still work to do, but this was a huge, huge milestone. We don't have a lot in the archives here at Springfield Armory that have to do with the general production of Springfield Armory. Um, a lot of that was taken with the Army or didn't get saved. But somewhat miraculously, we do have a set of drawings that was straight out of the model shop uh, that has to do with that uh, rehab, let's call it streamlining of, of production right after that initial uh, uh, manufacturing. So once, you know, after uh, serial number 87 uh, was produced, maybe the following spring, they started saying, all right, how do we make this more efficient? We're gonna to have to likely produce a lot of these in much higher numbers. What are efficiencies that we can look at and what are some machines that we can update? I mean, a lot of their machines, they were still using stuff that they made the 1903 on. And a lot of those machines were losing their accuracy or not capable of, of making things at the tolerance they were looking for for the M1. So they needed to do something. So, uh, beginning in the spring of 1938, they started looking at every single operation of every single component and laying it out. And in fact, we have um, some notes here, which I believe are in uh, John Grand's own hand, where, for example, this is the uh, gas cylinder. So, operation by operation, written out, you can see, uh, uh, where hand notes are saying layout of tooling. This is April of 1938. Modification to gas cylinder tooling layout, April of 1938. And so they're starting to make notes, uh, analyze things. They even brought people in from the outside to, to help say, you know, hey, what are, what's the industry doing uh, around the country and who's doing the best and how can we duplicate the, that here at Springfield Armory. So people from the outside are looking at this, uh, people from internally are looking at this. So this is actually comments from John Garand on the gas cylinder plug. Um, and he says, number one, in general, there seems to be possibilities for quite a few troubles to occur. You know, so they're thinking strategically, they're thinking long term. And what are some of the hangups that we can see with the way we do things now and how do we need to change? And so along with all these notes, we also have quite a few of these drawings. Um, that again, get into uh, nearly every single uh, operation on every single piece. We don't have them completely here. These are actually uh, 
more of the gas cylinder, but you can see they're making changes to tolerance, changes to measurements. So this is not only just this fascinating story about the development of an ex extremely innovative shoulder arm, it's also a story about industrial mass production and how it's, and how it's executed. Yeah. And these pieces of paper narrate the execution of industrial management. It sure does. And in a way, this is fascinating because so often we identify characteristics that define the American nation during the Second World War, and among the characteristics that we identify are things like competence and dedication to duty, and we're, I'm seeing all of that in these papers. So this is serial number 179, and there are some interesting things going on with it. I was interested in it and asked you to pull it down, mainly because we wanted an example that could help us narrate the story of the seventh round stoppage and how it was ultimately repaired mm -hmm. and how the rifles were modified. But then when we cut it out and we started looking closely at it, that's when the fun really started. Because this rifle is not just modified for the seventh round stoppage. This started off as a very early mass production M1 that then goes through the whole system to the extent that it's carrying T105 E1 <laughs> rear sights. It went through a post-war rebuild. It's got this high humped um, gas cylinder lock screw. It's got replacement wood and the barrel's kind of the best part. <laughs> it sure is. Harrington and Richardson, dated yeah. January of 1952. So it's kind of fun to see that the example we use to tell this one part of the early development story this rifle takes us from the very beginning of M1 production all the way through Korea and really takes us to end of production in a way because this rifle is around because this 179 is made at what, at one point in 1937? Yeah. I mean, if uh, number 87, I mean, this is only, what, uh, uh, another 90 or so, 92 off of... Uh, off of number 87 we just looked at. <laughs> uh, but this one went on a little more of an adventure. It, it sure looks did. Like. Now Alex, this could have been the US service rifle that fought the Second World War. Almost. This one in particular is uh, T3E2, serial number two. And according to uh, test records, they put this through an endurance trial in the fall of 1931. And what they did within the span of 55 minutes was put 1,400 rounds through it, and then cooled it off, cleaned it, and then fired another 760, so 2,160 rounds in the span of 55 minutes. And this thing passed with flying colors. The infantry board liked this rifle. And, uh, but it's too bad within, oh, three, four months of uh, this wonderful test, they said not so much to the 276. I still am contemplating the T3E2. I like to imagine it doing the fighting of the Second World War. I like to imagine GIs carrying these in their cartridge pouches and fighting their way uphill and down valley across Europe and islands in the Pacific. Do you think it would have been any different? I, that's just it, because part of me wants to imagine a world where this <laughs> makes a significant difference, but I, I don't believe that that would have been the case. Nevertheless, it's fascinating to imagine Americans with a little bit lighter, 10-shot semi-automatic rifle fighting World War II. This one has been personalized, and it seems like it's a little bit of a convoluted story, too, because I'm seeing <laughs> Uh, L Company 346th Infantry Regiment, and we have New Mexico, what else you got? Acorn, 87th Infantry Division, mm -hmm. an American flag, V for Victory, God Bless America, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, he's got a little heart with an arrow through it. Yeah, and probably best of all, we've got Claudia. Claudia. And so this, this stock has quite a story, and, and People here have done some research into it and been able to find it. It looks like there were multiple soldiers that put at least some aspect of their personal lives on here. Um, but, uh, but what kind of makes this interesting is that uh, it's still a gas trap. This yeah. is number 2025, pretty early production. 
especially interesting considering that if the if the action belongs to this stock, right. uh, this is a rifle that was issued to troops in the field yep. because the troops left their mark and narrate a little bit of story of this as a service rifle in action. And it never got any of the modified, so it's still a 22 inch long barrel gas trap M1, not modified for seventh round stoppage. Mm -hmm. And it happened, we know it happened, and uh, this could be one of the rifles that it happened to. Sure could. It uh, looks like it came into the museum here about 1948, um, which is kind of interesting. The, uh, and if you look at the unit history, uh, they came into ETO in late 44. So uh, if this was out there, this was uh, all the way through the war surviving in this configuration if, if indeed these two are matched pieces. This M1 presents every appearance of being garden variety vanilla and uninteresting. But there's a story, right? There sure is. So this one uh, was roughly uh, October 1940 production. In theory, was one picked right off the line, uh, picked by none other than John C. Grant, and uh, handed over to show the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the time, uh, exactly what Springfield Armory was up to. So at this stage of production, um, we have gotten past gas trap. So we're now a 24 inch gas port barrel. They've um, overcome the issue of the seventh round stoppage. Rifles are being modified and rifles are now being produced uh, without the problem that caused the seventh round stoppage. And so in, in a way, this rifle gets us um, past the end point of our story. This is a rifle that uh, represents perfectly what mass production of the gas port M1 rifle was during World War II. And this one was uh, really one of the beginnings of, of that, you know, when Springfield Armory really had it. Uh, if you back up a little bit from this, um, July 1st, 1940 uh, was the beginning of the Armory's fiscal year. And at that point, compared to the year previous, Springfield Armory's budget just went up by 250%. And so they were in the middle of making a totally new, modern uh, manufacturing facility. Uh, it was one of the best in the country uh, within six months of that. And uh, all that hard work uh, that uh, Garand and his team had done up to that point was really about to pay off uh, to the tune of uh, more than 3.8 million of these being made through the end of the war, uh, which at its peak is somewhere around 220 of these per hour uh, that they were able to do, uh, what's that, in early 1944 or so. So they had it down, they had it, and this is one of the first where you really get mass production. I bought my first M1 rifle the day I turned 18 using my high school graduation money. That was in 1987 and in the 32 years since then, I've learned a lot about the rifle and a lot about the man who designed it. This visit to Springfield has been great for two reasons. First of all, because it's brought me into a closer appreciation for the time period stretching between 1919 and 1940. The time period that began when John Garand um, came to Springfield Army to go to work and ends when the Gasport M1 rifle goes into mass production here. It took a great deal of human effort, ingenuity, competence, and cooperation to bring the M1 rifle through those early years. And I can see that all now so much more clearly. The second reason that this particular visit to Springfield has been edifying is because it brought me here to Hillcrest Park Cemetery, uh, to the grave of the man who designed the world's first successful semi-automatic service rifle. This man who, in an analog era, overcame technical and bureaucratic challenges that would have stalled the lesser mind. This man came to Springfield 100 years ago and created something that we are still talking about today. And so it only seems fitting that we should end this story 
here at his grave with a moment of silence for John C. Garand. My name is Marty Morgan, and on behalf of the Grand Collectors Association, thank you for watching. The Grand Collectors Association was created to exchange information and expand knowledge of the U.S. rifle caliber 30 M1. To preserve and publicize history of the rifle and its inventor, John C. Garand. To assist and encourage new collectors. To assist authors in writing new reference works to assist members in their collecting, and to encourage competitive and recreational safe shooting of the rifle. GCA membership is inexpensive and brings useful benefits. Members receive the GCA Journal, a publication that presents invaluable technical and historical information about the M1 rifle. Membership also qualifies you to make purchases through the Civilian Marksmanship Program. To apply, simply visit thegca.org where you can find a membership application form. You can even join online. It's well worth the low cost to join a community of people who collect and shoot the greatest battle implement ever devised.